to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I'm Colin Slade. And I'm Reed Gann, and we're your hosts for Commission Ed. So Colin, I'm just smiling. We are bringing a really interesting episode today. We found a unicorn. We did. Definition of Captain Jennifer Tilton. Fantastic interview. She seems like an awesome person. I could totally hang out with her, I'm sure. The 13 Mike Airfield Operations Officer. So Colin, in my decade in the Air Force... I have met one of these people, and this person had been in their career field a few weeks. Long story short, they had they were medically disqualified from their 12 series. They were a NAV on a C-130, had lost their flight certification due to some health things, and had just been designated to cross over into this career field. Hardly done anything. I don't even think they'd been to technical training yet. And that was it. That's the only person in this career field that I've ever met. And we, the Commission Ed podcast, we are going to bring you a fantastic (laughs) interview where Colin, you sat down and discussed with her this incredibly interesting career field. Yeah, it just blows my mind what this career field does on the daily basis, what it does for the Air Force, and that there are so few of them. So let's turn it over to Captain Jennifer Tilton, who actually, because there are so few of them, came as a recommendation from previous interviews, Slider and Wham. They happened to know Jennifer and gave the recommendation to us to interview her. So let's leave it there. Turn it over to Captain Jennifer Tilton. Captain Jennifer Tilton, welcome to the podcast. I am so excited to have you for a wide variety of reasons, but you know, we were talking just before we turned the mics on. I don't know what I need to know about airfield management and air traffic control. So I'm super excited to have you help me understand more about this side of the Air Force and to share your experience with the audience. Absolutely. Thank you for the invite. I'm always excited to do stuff like this because we're such a small career field, but it's such an important one. For sure. In many different aspects. And we're kind of a lot of time behind the scenes. People don't actually realize that. We exist sometimes, so I'm super excited to tell everyone about it. Yeah, and if you didn't exist, chaos. Chaos (laughs) everywhere, right? (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Well, very good. Before we get into your career field, let's have you introduce yourself a little bit, give you the chance here to speak to the audience, an opportunity to understand where you come from, what your background is, how you got into the Air Force, and bring us up to speed on how we are here today. Absolutely. So, yep, I'm Captain Jennifer Tilton. I'm originally from Texas, so I joined the military and went to college on the military's dime. I ended up going to the Air Force Academy in Colorado. Okay. That is how I ended up commissioning. I always kind of knew I was going to end up joining the military. My dad was an infantry Marine. Oh. My mom was Navy. She was a Navy cook. So military kind of ran in our blood a little bit. And the deal with my dad was... I was going to go to college and I was not going to enlist. So, (laughs) and that I was going to have to pick a different branch other than the Marines or the Army. So (laughs) that kind of ended up the deal. I ended up in the Air Force and went to the academy and studied behavioral science, graduated after four years. And I did end up picking airfield operations as my top choice. In all honesty, at the time, I did not know what I was picking. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, do any of us really know what we're getting ourselves into? (laughs) Right. Someone mentioned it to me one day, hey, I think this would be something that you would be good at. And I said, that sounds like a plan. So that's that's kind of how I ended up in the uh, 13 Mike world. Cool. Much to my benefit. I have absolutely loved it. Great. So you said that your dad was in the Marines. You said that he was into infantry, right? Yes. Yep. Was he enlisted or was he an officer? He was enlisted. Both my mom and dad were enlisted. Okay, cool. And so they provided a little bit more of that perspective for you and said, thou shalt not go enlisted. And 
I'm curious, you know, the enlisted Marines, they tend to get, you know, a little bit of the short end of the stick <laughs> for our enlisted troops. But I'm curious, what was it that they shared with you, your mom and your dad? What was it that they were trying to help you to avoid or push you toward in becoming an officer, going into the Air Force, or at least not going into the Marines of the Army? What were some of those conversations like? So in a lot of ways, it definitely shaped my personality that I've taken with me this entire time. But yeah. a lot of the conversations were just based on my dad's experience. So he was infantry Marine, and he was the one that was sleeping in holes and <laughs> sleeping on cots. Quite literally. Literally. And sleeping on cots with, you know, 300 other dudes in a tent. And so he, based on his experiences and kind of looking towards the Air Force, because, I mean, the Air Force does a lot of support for the Marines. Obviously, the Marines are on the ground, the Air Force is in the air. And my dad has always had a great vision of the Air Force and, you know, kind of on his deployments, looking towards the side and seeing the Air Force side and how the Air Force consistently had more money, consistently having more things available to them. So mm -hmm. a lot of the conversation was, well, do you want to be in an air-conditioned building with Wi-Fi or <laughs> do you want to sleep in a hole? So those are kind of the conversations that we ended up having. And, and college was just basically always on the table. He had always wished that he went to college. Okay. He said the whole point of him joining the military was so he didn't have to go to college, which he moderately regretted. Luckily, at this point, he has been to college and he's done his master's and all that, which he really enjoys. But that was always a conversation to make a little bit more money, be a little bit more, you know, comforted okay. <laughs> with the Air Force. And he realizes that the Air Force kind of treats their troops a little bit better as well. Okay, so it's more about the actual like experience of being in the Air Force versus the Marines or the Navy with your mom, as opposed to the mission that each of the different services carries out. Right. So your parents didn't necessarily have anything against what the Marines or the Navy were trying to do, or it wasn't a conversation around your interest in the projection of air power and providing support to those other branches. It was literally about what is life like in the military. Correct. Yeah. So he said, you know, if you're going to sustain a life in the military, let me show you a way to where your knees aren't going to break when you're 30 years old. <laughs> okay. So it was definitely more about his overall experience within the military versus kind of what the Air Force provides, generally speaking, with the mission. Because, I mean, he really didn't know other than getting that air support occasionally when he's on the ground. Okay. Yeah. And this is a normal conversation that comes up with parents to children brothers and sisters, you know, those who serve in different branches, the other branches of the military have a very important mission to carry out on behalf of the United States, and is no better or worse than what we do in the Air Force. But it does highlight that generally speaking, and this is not true for everybody, you know, your mileage will vary. The Air Force does do a really good job of trying to take care of us. True? They do. They absolutely do. Especially I've deployed with the Army a couple of times and the Air Force definitely gets the better end of the stick in a lot of ways. But that's just the nature of the mission in a lot of ways that the Air Force provides. Great. Cool. Yeah, I just wanted to highlight that for our audience, just to emphasize that all of the branches are necessary. What we do as a joint force is necessary, but not all branches are created equal, you know? Correct. <laughs> the experience is not created equal. Cool. You went to the Air Force Academy. Anything you want to share about your experience there that uh, would be good for our audience, knowing that we've covered what it's like to go to the Academy, what the cadet experience is, maybe just one or two things that really sticks out in your mind from your time there as a cadet. One of the main things is going there. I really was just going for an education. When I joined the Air Force, I didn't necessarily know what I wanted to do in the Air Force. Yeah. I kind of knew I just didn't want to be a pilot. <laughs> it was never, yeah, in all honesty, it was just never in my crosshairs. My dad was a Marine. I really liked looking at the helicopters sometimes, but it just was never something that was introduced to me growing up. So going there and kind of seeing that that is a very large pipeline yeah. into pilot training. That's what they do there? <laughs> that is what they do in a lot of ways. And, and it has changed since then. Obviously, UAVs started coming out while I was there, and so that turned into a a bigger, you know, realm for pilot training. So going there, I was kind of the oddball out in the sense that I didn't know what I really wanted to do. Yeah. I come from a family of enlisted Marines <laughs> and 
so taking that, I think that helped me, generally speaking, to maintain that personality throughout my experience and keep pushing through and understanding that I was the oddball out and that was fine Yeah, in a lot of ways. But at the end of the day, I did end up picking AFSC. That was perfect for me. Crazy enough. Yeah, you got lucky. <laughs> yeah, but, and it's also awesome. I didn't necessarily need a technical degree as well graduating from the Air Force Academy. Everyone graduates with a Bachelor of Science, but sure. mine was more in the neuroscience kind of psychology realm, which is a lot different than other folks. You know, I don't have an engineering background necessarily, but I also didn't need it for my career field, so... No, but as we'll get into here in just a second, you definitely need the psychology when you're dealing with those pilots and you know, the other operational career fields, the flyers. I'm sure there's quite a bit of opportunity for you to use some behavioral science. Absolutely. Working with them. Yeah. So throughout my time, basically, I mean, having grown up that way, I was constantly humbled, basically, through my experience there. I knew I was a little bit of the oddball, and I think everyone could have, everyone appreciated it. <laughs> Most of the time. <laughs> Excellent. Well, good. So you graduated, received your commission in what year? 2012. 2012. Awesome. So now nine years spent in the Air Force on active duty, but you've recently transitioned from the active side into the reserve component, right? Absolutely. Turns out there is a position, well, several billets that are open for 13 mics at Langley, because where I ended up doing my reserve transfer, but I did it right in the smack in the middle of COVID. So <laughs> yeah, I haven't been able to do much of the hands-on stuff quite yet, like I've wanted to, but so far it's been great for me at the time, felt like a good time to transition. And that's what I did. And it's honestly been awesome so far. So I get to stay in my career field, just do something a little bit different. Awesome. Cool. Yeah, we'll get into a little bit more about what that experience of transferring into the reserve has been like. But let's start having the conversation about the career field itself. And that will help us to lead into that conversation there about what you're doing for the reserve. So your career field is 13 Mike, airfield operations. I did say that right, because I always get confused. Is it air traffic control? Is it airfield management? It is airfield operations. It is. And I know a lot of people get the terminology a little bit confused all the time. So it is airfield operations, 13 Mike. Many people will say airfield management, which is just one small part of what airfield operations cover. Okay. Many people will call us you know, the air traffic control officers, which is, again, just another small part of kind of the day-to-day -day management that we do. But overall, generally, airfield operations just ensures safe takeoff and landing for aircraft. So anything basically with the word air in it, we typically have our hands on, okay. which can be difficult because in a lot of fashions, we may not be able to put our hands on everything that has the word air on it. Yeah. <laughs> or people might be confused about maybe some of the stuff that we actually do do versus what they kind of expect us to do, generally speaking. But it's, yeah, the overall management of the runways, managing the people really that run them. So we both work as liaisons for people basically who need access to the airfield and anything air related. Yeah. And that has actually been my experience working with airfield operations. So in my time as a civil engineer, I was stationed at Joint Base Andrews where Air Force One flies in and out of plus a whole slew of other cats and dogs there at that airfield. I mean, it is such a busy place. I don't know if you've had a chance to be there. You're at Langley. And so pretty similar in that, you know, that Northern Virginia, you know, East Coast center of uh, American power kind of thing. You probably experienced that a little bit. Absolutely. <laughs> but I was surprised to see how closely civil engineers and airfield operations have to work together because you guys own the airfield, but we maintain it. We take care of it. Correct. Yes. There's a really strong, or hopefully there's a really strong partnership there between the airfield operations officer, the civil engineering officer, and the people that we work with to make sure that the airfield is in a status and a condition that's going to support the flying missions. Absolutely. And so generally speaking, airfield operations has airfield management. It has what used to be called ATCALs air traffic control and landing systems. Mm -hmm. They now call them RAWS, radar, airfield, and weather systems. Yeah. But they're kind of the electrical mechanical engineers that do a lot of the work on the communications that are on the airfield. So radios, 
they'll do nav aids, that kind of thing. So that's one career field that people tend to forget that are actually in air for operations. And then, of course, we have the air traffic control side. Yeah. That includes both the tower that everyone knows and loves, the, yep. the big tall building, but we also have the radar controllers that are in the, what we call the RATCON, the radar approach control. Not every location has one, but most larger places do. So we do have a bunch of radar air traffic controllers as well. So it essentially covers three totally different AFSCs, which in a lot of ways confuses people because we do wear the air traffic control badge. Yeah. But in all honesty, I controlled traffic for maybe a year out of my life. And then since then, most of the job has been airfield management. Okay. Which fall under the command and control side of the house. So I think that's what kind of what confuses a lot of people. And like you said, partnerships are super big yeah. when it comes to airfield operations, because that's really what we're doing. We're managing what we can. And then we have the folks that actually, in a lot of ways, kind of do the work, particularly on the airfield. Obviously, the civil engineers are a big, big, big part of that. Yeah. For sure. Cool. Yeah. So definitely that was my experience. Sounds like yours as well, that partnership between airfield operations and the other parts of the Air Force that, again, are there to keep the flying mission going. And I just want to clarify one thing before we move on from that point. You say that you spent about a year doing air traffic control. So did you get like the, your FAA certification? You are a certified airfield air traffic controller. Is that part of it? I am. Okay. So, I mean, basic training for airfield operations. We go through four months of tech school out at Keesler Air Force Base. Okay. That covers the basics of air traffic control, basics of airfield management, basics of airfield operations management. And then we graduate and we're like, yay, I still don't know anything. So <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> then we actually go to our base and we do our upgrade training. Most 13 mics will go to a location that has two air traffic control facilities. So you learn both. It has both the RATCON and the tower as your baseline. So there is a minimum mission qualification that you do have to go through. And however, I was one of the lucky ones that either that both had the capability of and the timing to be able to get full FAA control tower operator certifications. So that's not the norm? Not necessarily. Okay. And in all honesty, a lot of the training, which the curriculum is kind of trying to fix, it depends on where you go. Okay. And it depends on what's available. And it depends on how much time because Throughout the Air Force, there's only about 250 of us. Oh, wow. So if you think about how many airfields exist, just CONUS and OCONUS, as well as, like I said, we do everything air-related. So we have airspace as well positions. There are only 250 of us. So at any given point in time, even through training, you might be now the person in charge, even though you don't have your minimum qualifications. Wow. To be able to do that. That's crazy. 250 of you in the Air Force. And is that just on the active side or is that the whole total force? That is mostly total force. So 250 about on the active side. But in all honesty, there's only three of us that are on the reserve side. <laughs> oh, wow. You're one of so, the three. Yeah, I'm one of the three that are on the reserve side. There's not a whole lot of billets open for us. But interesting. Yeah. So there's Generally speaking, not a whole lot of opportunities in the reserve for us. There's only two locations for us to go, which we can probably talk about a little later. But yeah, there's just not very many of us. And so we tend to be spread kind of thin, particularly in deployments. <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to say, and definitely want to you know, come back to that here in a second. So with the 250 of you spread throughout all of the Air Force, is that just at locations that have an actual flying mission? It's got a runway, it's got a tower, or is it possible for you to go to some other bases that are just an air base wing? It is possible for us to go to other places as well. And it's because another side of airfield operations is not just kind of the tactical hands-on airfield side. We have airspace, combat airspace is what we call it. So anywhere where there is built or not built airspace available, we have positions in those locations as well. Like for instance, there is a position in Yuma, Arizona, that we're essentially an airspace liaison for the Marines. Oh. So again, anything with the word air in it, we, we probably have our hands on just a little bit behind the scenes. Interesting. So does that mean that there are opportunities like on the regular basis for you to be part of the joint operations because you're providing that kind of liaison 
perspective and responsibility for the Air Force to the other services? Absolutely. And it's very clear, especially during deployments, that that is a big part of what we do. Like we talked about partnerships with civil engineering. That is a huge partnership for us as well in a joint environment, because if there are air assets that aren't necessarily Air Force, congratulations, we have a new partner. <laughs> awesome. You know, it's probably their flight safety liaison, that kind of thing. So we work very, very closely with our joint partners, no matter where we're at, whether we're at a joint base or on deployments in particular is really where I've seen it. Wow, that's fascinating. To take such a small career field, you know, 250 total across the total force, that just boggles my mind. <laughs> and it doesn't even necessarily need to be because they have air assets. In a lot of ways, you know, there is a runway available at whatever location. Mm -hmm. It could just be something as minor as a army unit needs to be able to drive on the flight line. They need to get from point A to point B, yeah. and now they have to coordinate with us, right. and we have to get those procedures in place. So it doesn't even necessarily need to be air assets that we have that partnership with. Okay. So anytime just dealing with the airfield itself, whether that particular mission is flying or not, if they have anything to do with the airfield, they're going to have to interface with airfield operations. Definitely. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. And this kind of gets back to something I wanted to highlight, revisit a little bit more is this partnership. Like who are the customers that airfield operations exist for? Obviously the flying community, the people who are actually getting into the jet, taking off, landing, that sort of thing. But maybe bigger picture, you, know, you say anybody who has air in the name or anything that has air in the name, who are those people that you primarily exist for? Yeah, I mean, obviously, you just hit it. Our primary customer are the pilots. Okay. They're the air crew members that are coming in, you know, flying and taking off, that kind of thing. Some of the ones are particularly on deployments or maybe other locations that we partner pretty close with or that are our customers could also be like Army fires. Okay. You know, we have howitzers out there and we're trying to clear airspace so they can actually do their mission as well. Yeah, that's a really interesting thing. Yeah. And you see that kind of with maybe on the Navy side, if they're wanting to shoot tomahawks, that kind of thing. We also partner on that side as well. So those are our customers. Could be either joint or could just be Air Force. No telling. <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting thing that it's not just flying operations. Again, it's anybody who's putting stuff into the air <laughs> there too. <Absolutely. laughs> they may be on the ground, but they need the airspace to be free of obstruction or aircraft or anything like that so that they can do their training. So yeah, again, this very small career field continues to show how big and important it is. Right. And it continues to grow even when you think outside of the military. So my last location, actually, the radar facility, the radar air truck control facility controlled nine other satellite airports. So that included civilian airports, that includes civilian airspace. So one of our major partnerships, at least in the United States, is the FAA. Okay, yeah. In other places like the United Kingdom, which I was, in England, it's the Civil Aviation Authority. So all of the normal civilian air traffic control side of that house, we work very closely with as well. We're definitely kind of the military liaison to those civilian airports. Yeah. So many of these partnerships continue to just come out of, it's not just the Air Force, it's not just joint, it's civilian, it's international. There's an opportunity for you as a 13 Mike Airfield Operations Officer to interface with all of these different communities and gain that experience and, and provide value to each of these different organizations in order to accomplish not just the Air Force mission, but the joint mission, and not just that either. It literally goes to the highest levels of what we're trying to do as the United States. You were there in England, so there's a NATO aspect to it. Man, like I said, this just continues to grow and show how important the mission is of what you do. Absolutely. That's so fascinating. And I want to give you the chance here to speak more to what you're doing now in the reserve. Because as we were talking before we turned the mics on, you are in the process now of getting to the other side of airfield operations that you've done, the airfield management, the air traffic control piece, but now you are preparing to start working in combat airspace. So I want to give you the chance to explain a little bit more about what that's like and help the audience understand that part of airfield operations. 
Yeah, so I am currently doing combat airspace in the reserves. That's what I got hired on to do. It does exist as billets and positions, active duty, just like any other airfield operations position. So there's kind of two sides of the house. There's the airfield side and the airspace side, and both are available active duty. But currently, which is kind of exciting and new, I get to do the combat airspace side. So a lot of folks don't necessarily understand joint airspace control particularly in a deployed environment. Yeah. It could be peacetime FAA, National Airspace System, but most of the time we're working because of the deployed locations. And we're attempting to essentially provide minimum risk and attempting to create a lot of procedural control for the airspace because we call it airspace chaos. <laughs> yeah. If we're not around, essentially, because blue suitors think of blue airspace and our blue assets. Green suitors think of green airspace and their ground-based assets, or even their air assets. The Navy think of their brown suitors, their gray airspace, that kind of thing. Yeah. Marines. So they all have their own. And then special operations just don't want to tell anybody anything. So, so it can be airspace chaos because like we kind of talked about and hit on is, you know, not only are there all kinds of aircraft flying around and doing these big missions, there's also fires that are happening, like yeah. ground-based army air defenses and that kind of stuff that's going on and that are also a huge part of our, you know, joint team essentially. So Combat airspace, even with our best efforts, is still kind of chaotic, but we try to minimize the risk and prevent fratricide as much as humanly possible, Okay, which is why we exist. So we have our airspace management team, and essentially what we are is liaisons for every other, whether it be coalition or joint liaisons that are operating in the airspace. So we kind of push out a lot of the airspace control orders that come down. So it's a little bit more, I would say, on the strategic vision of the kind of deployed environments, the mission versus the airfield side, which I would kind of see as more of the tactical side because you have your hands a little bit more dirty, I would say, on that side of the house. Yeah. Really, we're just there to prevent airspace chaos and trying to prevent mishaps from happening and fratricide and trying to actually hit the targets that we're planning on hitting. So I have to ask, what you're describing Sounds a lot like the air battle management career field, the 13 Bravo, and I'm seeing you nod and smile. Maybe so there is some overlap there. Is there an opportunity for you to work with them? Is that the point and purpose of the combat airspace piece of the airfield operations career field? So we do work in deployed locations for the airspace side really closely with the air battle managers. But okay. what we like to say is air battle managers like to put aircraft together. Airfield operations and airspace want to put planes apart. Okay. So, yeah, we're trying to keep planes apart and they're trying to put them together. Like so, yin and yang kind of thing. Yeah. So there is definitely a partnership there. There's a lot of communication that has to happen in order for that to be a more smooth partnership with air battle managers because we are yin and yang. We're on two opposite sides of the spectrum. So yeah, there definitely has to be a lot of communication working with them for those kinds of things. But at the end of the day, we're all working towards the same goal. Yeah. So... As part of that partnership and to enable that communication, are you on the AWACS with them or are you on the ground in their control center or what does that relationship look like? Typically on the ground in the control center. So typically they will have an air battle manager liaison that works with us okay. that are on the ground. So we're not actually in the AWACS flying around with them. So typically, yeah, they have a liaison that's on the ground that's that's there to talk to us and, and work with us. Okay, very interesting. And you mentioned earlier that you're in the process of training for that. So you haven't yet started doing that as your primary duty. Still have to go through IQT, MQT. You want to talk a little bit about what that looks like as you move from one part of the career field to the other. Definitely. So regardless of kind of what I did on the active duty side, I still have to go through the training for combat airspace. And it's the same on the active duty side. It's the same courses. It's the same upgrades. And it's because of COVID, I haven't quite been able to do it full time, but I was able to do my IQT, my initial qualification training out at Herbert Field in Florida. Okay. And it's a combat airspace course. So they teach you all about combined air traffic control, combined. We typically work at a KOC with the combat airspace, which is the uh, combined air operations center. Yeah. So there's so many different folks that are in that room that are working with us. To not only do they introduce you to your job in the combat airspace part of what you do, but they're also there to introduce you to what a KOC looks like and how it runs. So we do a couple of exercises while we're there on top of our typical airspace 
criteria or curriculum that we go through, which is, I mean, they basically teach us how to use what we call our weapon system. So computer-based operations, and they teach us how to do that communication, that liaisoning and deconflicting airspace with, you know, a hundred different partners and, you know, and actually physically building airspace. Interesting. And so what is the typical you know, like timeline for that training out of one aspect of airfield operations into the other? What is that typical timeline? So typically, at least on the active duty side, which I'll speak to just a little bit, it's typically you are doing the combat airspace course active duty because you were deploying. Okay. So you go through the IQT course, which is a month long, and you are basically straight on an airplane out to deploy and to use that new skill that you just you just earned yourself. On the reserve side, it's just a little bit different. Okay. I would say they baby us maybe a little bit more, but... All three of you? Yeah, all three of us. We go through the IQT course, the four-week course, and then we have to get MQ. So essentially for active duty, the MQ is your deployment. For us, our mission qualification upgrade is just an exercise. So, you know, we exist in the reserves to help kind of facilitate some of those active duty positions that, you know, 250 of us have to fill. Yeah try to help them out, particularly in the chaotic environment. So with that comes a lot of exercises that consistently happen out at many different locations. Could be in Korea, could be in Shaw, could be at the Deed. So several different locations. But yeah, the MQ upgrade, which is really only two weeks long, is an exercise. Okay. So you're basically, you're doing it in person. Okay. Very cool. So you'll finish that and then that will be your primary responsibility on the reserve side is to facilitate that creation of the airspace, trying to prevent chaos from ensuing as best as you can, (laughs) partnering with the joint force to deconflict the flyers from the fires (laughs) and making sure that we're able to carry out the air mission, whatever service needs to do that. Correct. You totally hit it on the head. (laughs) <laughs> awesome. See, you, you can teach some other people to understand these kinds of things. And it just shows how much I didn't understand about airfield operations prior to this interview today. So thank you so much for clearing this up. It has been extremely valuable for me. I hope it has been for the audience as well. But there is one more thing that I think we need to cover about the career field before we wrap up here. Why is an officer doing this job? That's what I need to understand. Absolutely. So we didn't really touch on it, but depending on what location you're at, you could be leading 80 folks or 130. So there's quite the wide span, but you're there essentially to be that servant leader. We exist to kind of be that backbone and prevent you know, all those partnerships that we have from kind of collapsing in on your people. So you're there to protect them in a lot of ways and to both understand or kind of teach what they're doing is important, which is really easy to do, but also kind of teach those partnerships and those folks that you're working with on the outside, what we can provide to you and what we can't. Mm -hmm. In a lot of ways, you know, we're always trying to get to yes. We always want to provide you what you want, but sometimes it just may not be able to happen. It could be because of regulations or safety or whatever it is. So in a lot of ways, we're just that backbone. We're that safety center. So people aren't just chaotically trying to throw their assets around and kind of do what they want. So yeah, that's absolutely why we're there. We're there to be that buffer. So you are using your commission and the leadership skills that you gain through your commissioning source and, and your time and your experience as you come up in the career field to provide that guidance and that leadership to your enlisted airmen. You're providing top cover for them, Mm -hmm. making sure that they don't get used and abused by the other members of the flying community. And you're also there to provide education and to liaise with those other organizations so that they understand what is and is not possible with the flying mission. Absolutely. Yeah, we're trying to just be that buffer. And like you said, not be used and abused. (laughs) So because we do touch everything with the word air in it, but we can't make miracles happen either. So I would beg to differ. You know, (laughs) I think that for a community that is so small, every day that you accomplish the mission, it's nothing short of a miracle because (laughs) you don't have, you know, just an unlimited number of bodies to throw at the problem. 
you're having to use the skills that you've gained, you know, through your training, through your commissioning source, through mentorship within the community itself, in order to make sure that this all important thing that we do, the projection of air power comes off successful. And I will say to the folks that are maybe considering their career field, a lot of what officership is too, in some ways, and at least in my career field, you do have to do the stuff that people don't like to do. You have to do the paperwork. Yeah. You have to do those documents, the documentation, the feedback, the stuff that's uncomfortable and that people don't necessarily like to do. But at the same time, you're learning how to be a leader. You're thinking creatively. You're able to work with a whole lot of different partners and manage budgets and accounts and do all kinds of crazy stuff that's essentially going to help you yeah. be a really great manager and leader on the outside. Because in all reality, you do start so young doing that yeah. and pretty immediate in a lot of ways. Yeah. Having to lead and, and lean on your enlisted. Yeah, absolutely. And I also want to just touch on real quick, because you are an officer, you go through the same typical officer development process. You're going to do your professional military education. You'll go to SOS, ACSC, Air War College. Those things are available to you. Organizationally, the airfield operations officer in that function is going to follow up as part of the operations support squadron. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. So airfield operations does fall within the OSS typically. And then as you kind of hit on, we do have the normal PME options that are available to us, but there's also other things that I have heard. I haven't actually done any sort of greater research on it, but again, like the word air, there are some 13 mics that have the ability to, for instance, go to language school okay. and be an airspace liaison or be that kind of air liaison in a foreign country, whether it be Morocco or Paris and work in embassies or you know there are 13 mic lawyers oh okay yep they can send you to law school and now you are an airspace lawyer wow so there are so many different opportunities that are available why is this career field so small <laughs> <laughs> because this is a good question <laughs> we are constantly on the critical man list yeah i can imagine but so there are so many other opportunities to be able to do kind of this job in many different facets. So, which I think is absolutely awesome. You just have to kind of research those opportunities and kind of, you know, yeah, do that research yourself and, okay. and ask around. And so interesting because you are so small, you're already spread thin because you are so important. You're being farmed out to all of these other things so that you can bring that skill back into the career field. On top of that, you've got all of the normal developmental milestones that you have to hit the PME. You're going to do flight command. I imagine there's opportunity for squadron command and even beyond that group command, maybe wing command even. I don't know. It sounds like it should be available to you. Maybe, correct me if I'm wrong. So I will say our career field is a little bit behind or a little bit kind of new. We used to about I want to say maybe 10 years ago, eight to 10 years ago, we used to be called CATCOs. So we were the air traffic control officers only. Obviously, we have expansively grown since then. So we have yes. taken airfield management under our wing. We have taken now APCALs under our wing. And so we keep growing, which in turn, our crew field is also kind of growing. So we may not be 250 deep all the time, which you can kind of see within our crew growth as well. After kind of the captain realm, which is what you're doing in the airfield or the combat airspace, you're doing the tactical side of the house. Beyond that, at that point, you could either kind of be vectored towards maybe squadron command or towards staff officer mm -hmm. doing airspace on that side and doing combat plans and that kind of stuff. But beyond that, there's not a whole lot for us, at least at this point. We actually, which was a celebration in our community, had our first general officer. Oh, about, I want to say three years ago now, actually, so we first general <laughs> in our career made it. So, so, you know, you're looking for rank. This isn't the place for it. Okay. You're there to be that servant leader and to be that buffer, but you're in a lot of ways, kind of that tactical expert and that technician and you're doing the mission. Okay. And not necessarily, you know, being that we in command a little later. Okay. But the potential is there. You are an officer. And so the intrinsic potential for command is there. And because you're part of the operations community, who most typically are the ones who are going to reach those higher levels of command, the possibility exists. But because of the numbers, just because there aren't that many of you, that's not the norm. Absolutely. And, you know, someone has to be first. So yeah, 
why not now? Obviously, we had our first general officer. Yeah. So why not have our first maybe wing commander and, you know, and so on and so forth. So there's always a first for everything. So yeah, for sure. It's absolutely on the table for, for that kind of growth. Okay. Well, again, Jennifer, this has been fascinating. So helpful. There are so many things that I had no idea I didn't know about airfield operations. And I am one of those partners with the community that interfaces with you on the regular basis. So I thought I knew something I clearly did not. Thank you for clearing that all up for me. And obviously, there was so much that we didn't even touch on that would still be really valuable to our audience. And so I want to give uh, you the opportunity to let them know how should people get in touch with you if they have more questions, if they're interested in becoming a 13 Mike airfield operations officer, if they are part of one of those partners, if they're in one of those partner communities and they want to understand how better to work with airfield operations, how do you want people to get in touch with you? So I'm a millennial and I <laughs> am great at text messaging and answering the phone, which is typically how I will kind of give that feedback to folks that are looking at 13 Mike as a career field. So I would email Colin and you can absolutely get in touch with me anytime. I'm absolutely ecstatic to talk about the career field just because we're so unknown. And it's been such a blessing for me to actually do this as a job and get all of these skills. And it's been absolutely fantastic. So that would be great. You know, anybody that wants to get in touch with you, just email airforceofficerpodcast at gmail.com and we'll make sure that they get put in touch with you. Definitely. Great. Jennifer, one final question to wrap this all up. What does it mean to be an officer? Man, it means you need to be that servant leader. You have to be someone that your team trusts and you have to have that open door policy. If you don't, people aren't going to necessarily trust you, which in turn, they're not going to want to follow you. So that's kind of my leadership philosophy throughout to be that open door and that open ear and garner that trust for folks. And, and I think that is honestly the most important thing that you can provide people. Awesome. Yeah, it makes me think about Colin Powell saying that if ever there's a time where your people stop bringing you their problems, you have lost the ability to lead them. Definitely. Yeah, trust plays a huge factor. For sure. And being available like I said, open door. But I will say to the young folks that are kind of looking at the career field or even any others, seek out those opportunities and learn about you know, maybe something that'll excite you a little later in your career or you know, fight for those opportunities and get out of your comfort zone because those have been the best experiences that I've had, particularly on deployments, for sure. So Awesome. Yeah, I, we didn't even get into your deployments and working with the Army. Again, so much that we could have covered, but I'm really grateful for the things that we were able to touch on. So grateful for your experience, your willingness to come on the show here today and share all of that with our audience. Anything else that you want to leave them with before we wrap up here? No, nope, feel free to get in contact with me. I got some awesome stories for you. Excellent. Thank you, Jennifer Tilton. This has been a pleasure. Thank you. All right, Reed, you've heard everything that, well, maybe not absolutely everything, but you heard a lot of what airfield operations officers do for the Air Force, the incredible reach that they have, the effect that they have on the projection of air power. And yet there's only 250 of them in the entire total force, including the three that are in the Air Force Reserve. It just blows my mind that, that this career field is so small. What are your thoughts? What are your impressions? Just... We have such a narrow view about what an Air Force officer is. This is just another example of, you know, we've interviewed a few people that are in small career fields that are not very known. And, and we're really excited when we do that because we get to bring our audience some more information. That's one of the whole points of this podcast, Colin, is to provide people with a resource so that they can learn and make better decisions. If you want to be close to the pointy end of the spear, but maybe pilot isn't for you, look at this career field. They touch everything yeah. with air operations. And just look at the AFSC, right? The actual numbers and letters. 13 Mike is really close to the front. We've broken that down before, right? Right. A one series is operations. And the closer you are to one, one, which is pilot, the closer you are to the pointy end of the spear. 13, that is literally like the next step outside of the jet. Yeah. I mean, that's how, <laughs> yeah, it just kind of blew my mind. And how many options are out there that, 
we just barely scratched the surface. We're trying to bring you more. We know there's some gaps in our interview, you know, list, and we're trying to close those, but just a fantastic interview. Jennifer did a great job. Yeah, knowledge bombs the whole time, but man, it's just a small field. So interesting. Yeah, which really boggles my mind because as a civil engineer, and I got into this in the interview, I was spending time with airfield operations officers all the time because we'd be talking about projects on the airfield and how it was going to affect operations, the flying mission, all of those things. And so it was just kind of in my mind that everybody knows an airfield, airfield operations officer because they're constantly involved in the flying mission. But apparently that's not the case. I mean, you said at the top of the episode that you've only met one in your entire... And how is that possible, Reed? Because you are an intel officer. You do operations. And uh, uh, you're a 14N, which is just right, like another right next step to 13. away from the... Yeah, exactly. Right next to 13. Like, <laughs> yeah. So how is this possible that you have only ever met the one? Yeah. Real quick, the easy answer is Intel is such a broad career field that you could spend your entire career field, your entire career working for other national agencies that have nothing to do with the military even. Okay. Or you could spend your whole career working with pilots and aircraft and everything in between. So I haven't spent as much time on that tactical end. I've spent more time operational and strategic. Okay. So that's the easy answer. But I think the real heart of the matter about why is, I, I, I don't know. Honestly, as I think, of, <laughs> I'm like, they touch everything. How are we not more involved with them? And, and maybe it's because I'm focused on red. Yeah, okay. You know, I'm always looking out. You know, I'm not looking in at blue as much. And maybe that's a side of it. But you know how in every large organization, there's always somebody that has the keys to the kingdom. And it's mm -hmm. not always someone that you automatically recognize. For example, like sometimes the one, you know, quiet, old looking lady who sits in the command section, but isn't the commander's boss exactly, you know, just like that one lady and you're like, Ooh, I need to be friends with them. Yeah. You know, cause <laughs> they're the ones that know all the gossip. They know where all the, the skeletons are that these people have the power. I feel like that's this career field for the air force. Like a lot of people may not know who they are, but man, they own the airfield. And if they own the airfield, they own operations. Well, not just the airfield, the airspace too. Yeah, there's yeah, there's a lot more to it. Because the mission has expanded. It used to be just the air traffic control piece of it, right? Yeah. But it's recently expanded and here they are interfacing with the air battle manager and in the joint space, all of the flyers for the Navy, the Army, the Marines, as well as the ground fires mission. You know, we talked about it in the interview. Anybody that wants to put something up in the sky, they're gonna have their fingers on it, right? Which, since we're the Air Force, is kind of a thing. Just I'm throwing that out there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's just, oh, but yeah, but they are that quiet little lady who sits in the corner who's really <laughs> running things that no one knows about. Like, yeah. that's, that's kind of my analogy. <laughs> that's what, as I was going through the, you know, listening to Jennifer, and, and she did a great job. Who is not a quiet old lady, by the no, way. Oh, yeah, and I don't, I don't want to be pejorative or anything like that, but I'm using that as a visual for how this career field kind of came out to me. Yeah, it just, again, it's blowing my mind that there's only 250 of them, and they're spread out across the, you know, 60-something-ish bases that we have in our inventory, plus they're doing all of these other things, like talked about PME, deployments, working with joint partners. And so if you do the math, these people really are a unicorn like there's going to be one or two of them at a base and that's when there's a flying mission right yeah and so it's really not a surprise that in if you do the math that way that you haven't run into them where you know obviously just by virtue of what i do as a civil engineer what i have done in the past i was talking to them all the time yeah so everybody has a different perspective and it's good to share this information so that we all get a much better idea of what each kind of officer is doing out there in the Air Force. Yeah. If you want to be a technician and you want to stay doing the job instead of flying a desk and you want to be in operations, maybe this is a career field you ought to think about. Yeah. I thought that was super interesting. Very short pyramid, right? You might make 06, but they don't even care. It's do the J-O-B. I thought that was yeah. very, very interesting. Yeah, she plain and simple said that if you want rank, this probably isn't, the career field for you. But just like we've been saying, if you want to touch air power, if you want to have your fingers on everything, here you go. This is the way to do it. And because they do touch everything, 
how is it that there are so few of them that are making 06? And as she said that they just barely got their first general officer. Yeah. I, it, I don't know what's going on here. I don't want to say that the Air Force has it wrong or that they have it right, but it just doesn't make sense to me that a career field that seems so critical to what we do is promoting so poorly is poorly the right word i don't know i don't know because i wonder if it's one of those things that they are a victim of technology Mm. i wonder if gps for example has changed the number of people that have to be in the towers or the ability of long-range communications or you know i don't know i would need to do a lot more historical reading i'm not a flyer i don't have you know a deep understanding of how you know history and Here's a quick example. Back in the day when we used to have spacecraft with people flying in them, you know, the Apollo missions and things of that nature, we had to have these stations all over the planet with people sitting in them in order to communicate with those spacecraft as they circled the globe. Right. We can do that all now automatically with remote sites that don't have people in them. Mm -hmm. That's just an example of what I was wondering, you know, maybe they're small because technology has forced them to be small. You know, we can do things remotely now. I don't know. I don't have enough understanding of it. But that's kind of the first thought I had was. Yeah. And then the other thought is like the future of airfield operations just in general. Like, you know, we know that General Brown is a huge fan of having an agile force, being able to, I'm blanking on the term. Yeah. Agile basing is the technology. Agile basing. Thank you. Yeah. That's the phrase. And and the basic premise is, you know, imagine a flight four ship of F-35s, they land on some random road in the middle of Eastern Europe, and then a C-17 lands right behind them. And Mm -hmm. then a crew of maintainers and loaders and gas people, they just go and take care of the jets and then they take off again. And then the base is gone, right? Yeah. And that's just because the ability of our enemies to reach out and touch us at hardened, easily locatable facilities is such that we won't have them if we get into a a hot war. Yeah, so because of that change in thinking, the change in the way we base our operations, that obviously is gonna have an effect on the airfield operations officer. Maybe you just get rid of the airfield and you just call it the air operations officer. And maybe there's more of them because there are so many different places that we could potentially go, or maybe there's fewer of them. Yeah. But you know, to me, it seems like a a pretty binary thing that there's the future of this career field is either going to grow or it's not. (laughs) Yeah, it was so fascinating just to hear the different views and different experiences and perspectives that Jennifer shared. And I'm just I'll be honest, Colin, I'm a little proud that we brought a 13 mic on the podcast. That was a hard thing. Good job us. Sorry. I, I know you shouldn't be that way. But When you sent me the recording, you're like, hey, we're going to do this one on the airfield operations. I was like, wow, (laughs) good on you. (laughs) So, Jennifer, thank you for joining and sharing your unique experience. And audience, if you found this valuable, if you think that this might touch somebody in a way that, you know, could tickle their interests, send it on. Share it with them. Please. And hopefully we can get some more good folks coming in to replace Jennifer now that she's transitioned over the reserve. We need to get that number up, Colin. We need to get that number up. Exactly. And just like Slider and Wham did for us in recommending Jennifer to do an interview, if there's anybody out there that feels like we need to highlight a specific career field, you know, one of these unicorns, send us the recommendation because we know lots of people read, you know, we've been in the Air Force for a while. We know many officers in a variety of career fields, but we don't know them all. Yes. So we can very greatly benefit from you all providing these recommendations to us. So please, Share the interview with your friends, your family, your network. Also, share with us your recommendations on who we might interview next. Awesome. Again, thank you, Jennifer, for joining us. We really had a good time. And hopefully we can get some information out there that can be beneficial to you, our audience. And with that, that will conclude this week's episode of Commission Ed. Commission Ed.